Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutud. Welcome to Consider This. Businesses across Malaysia are responding to the changes brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic by turning to technology. So today we take a closer look at how technology can help the recovery and improve long-term viability of two specific sectors. Let's begin with the aerospace maintenance repair and overhaul sector, better known as the MRO sector. Malaysia is the second largest aerospace market in Southeast Asia and the largest aerostructures manufacturer in the region. Najib Mohamed Noor joins us on the show now. He's the CEO of engineering services company Strand Aerospace Malaysia. Najib, welcome to the show. It's good of you to join us today. Begin our conversation, you know, I I, um, I understand, you know, we all know how COVID-19 has crippled the, the pandemic and the lockdowns have crippled the aerospace and aviation industry. But help us understand the knock-on effect the pandemic has had on the aerospace supply chain, uh, particularly Malaysia, since we are uh, we have positioned ourselves as an MRO hub. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what the past uh, six, uh, 18 months have been like for this specific sector. So, okay, thank you very much for that. So I'll comment because uh, in context of also my presidency is, uh, of the Malaysian Aerospace Industry Association. So we cover both the MRO and the manufacturing industry. Uh, so specifically for the MRO, maintenance repair overhaul uh, part of the industry, obviously there's been a slowdown uh, because there's less aircraft flying. Yeah? Having said that, um, the MRO industry doesn't stop, um, although there's few aircraft, aircraft on the ground still need to be maintained. Uh, at the outset, uh, early on um, in sort of 2019, uh, that, that level dropped down to between 30 to 40 percent only of what was the, uh, the volumes that we were maintaining. right? Uh, and in Malaysia, we are a major um, aerostructures maintenance hub, which means we maintain the fuselage, the cockpit, the body, um, the wings, uh, the landing gear of the aircraft. Um, and also we are a major uh, engines um, maintenance and overhaul center because uh, we have GE engine services in uh, Subang, which is uh, the only full overhaul center for the A320 and the 737 engines in the region. So all of those dropped by about 30 to, to about 30 to 40 percent capacity um, on the onset of the uh, pandemic. That slowly crept up as uh, international uh, businesses in other sort of geographies has picked up. So I think uh, regional travel in other countries um, where the pandemic uh, or where vaccination is more uh, rife, um, that's that's increased uh, the. The domestic travel quite substantially. I think China is nearly uh, it's nearly back at parity. So um, we are provide because we are a global services provider. We are also then uh, servicing those markets right for for the aircraft and the engines there. For manufacturing, there was a delay in the um, um, receipt of the aircraft by the airlines. Right, so we have a backlog order of about forty thousand aircraft uh, prior to the uh, pandemic. That backlog order hasn't really changed because order book has pretty much stayed intact. What's happened is that the airlines have had um, a deferment in terms of their, their picking up of their planes, if you like. Um, and so um, that was at uh, down to about 40, 30 percent, sorry, 30 percent, 35 percent capacity um, just before, uh, just on the onset of the pandemic. Um, today, we are back at about 40, 45 percent capacity and climbing steadily upwards. Najib, you know, for many uh, sectors, uh, the, co the pandemic has been a kind of wake-up call uh, to either accelerate the adoption of technology innovation or to rationalize their operations and become tighter and so on and so forth. I mean, what has been the response here? Has it been to hope that things, uh, uh, you know, pick up and therefore you can carry on as, as business as usual? Or has, has there been some significant... Uh, you know, changes in the way things operate here? So I think uh, first thing to appreciate is that the aerospace industry is a globalized supply chain, right? And it's a globalized technological supply chain. So every member of that supply chain is working first with the same standards. So any company in, you know, if you were in Klang or something like that, producing aerospace parts, you'd be producing it to the same standards as you would in, say, Bremen in Germany, right? So as part of that globalized supply chain, technology development becomes part of uh, what requirement of the OEM as part of the supply chain uh, continuity, right? So um, prior to COVID, the fourth industrial revolution was already, you know, on the onset, right? So the modernization of the supply chain was already something the OEM was pushing through. 
as a requirement. So digitization, uh, automation, and all that kind of stuff that was that was that was already uh, on the on the roadmap, and the companies were beginning the transformation. What COVID nineteen has done is accelerated that. Yeah, um, it's also accelerated the um, the um, the adherence to sort of the carbon targets, the carbon emission targets of the EU, um, and with that, um, we see accelerated goals in as far as the uh, carbon footprint of the aviation sector is concerned. So with that also, the Malaysian supply chain, both for the maintenance and the manufacturing sector, we are, we are being asked to modernize our, uh, our capabilities and uh, our, cap our skill sets as well to meet the post-recovery requirements, which are both a recovery in as far as uh, volumes is concerned, right? But also to prepare for new types of aircraft which have um, more consideration for environmental um, uh, impact. Right. And, and Najib, is there, uh, may I use the word bandwidth for modernizing the, the capability? Given that, you know, you said uh, it's quite surprising to hear that the industry has dropped to to 30% of what you know what what you used to see previously now when you're just trying to recover and trying to build back is there is there bandwidth to to modernize at the moment because you know there's a concept there's the the preconceived idea that uh, technology and digitalization all of that requires high capital uh, yes. So well, what's interesting is obviously these uh, companies um, that are in the supply chain, uh, first of all, risk management is, is central to any aerospace company, right? This is where I, I've noticed because I do a lot of consulting for companies who are trying to get into the aerospace supply chain for, say, like the E&E sector or the machinery equipment sector. Uh, and for, 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 for the kind of uh, goods which are associated with sort of consumer or more general purpose goods, they don't have same type of, uh, sort of risk profile management and therefore the risk profile um, capability the risk management capabilities of these companies for for um, for incidents such as this is, is very low right mm -hmm. even prior to any government initiative to uh, regulate industries movements the aerospace industry already instigated its SOPs as a matter of cost right so the bandwidth that you're talking about here is something that these guys then start planning straight away, right? right. Um, now, yes, it's obviously uh, incumbent. Um, and yes, we need support um, from the government. As uh, you see, the French government has pumped in, what, 1.3 billion euros specifically for the aerospace industry to support this modernization in its supply chain. Uh, but that planning is also in tandem with what the companies have been planning as well. So they've adjusted but continue to invest in this modernization, that's just part of the cost for for aerospace companies, right? So yes, it's going to be tough. But what's interesting is as well is that some obviously liquidity issues in the West have resulted in more contracts coming out to the East. Oh. So we've seen a, a high increase in requests for quotations. Um, some of the uh, MRO work has been rerouted to Malaysia. Uh, obviously, the uh, MCOs have not been helpful with that. Um, so Malaysia is uh, a preferred country for skills and com competences in aerospace and so high value activities associated with aerospace, right? So you look at drone technology, um, you look at you know, urban air mobility, all these new investments, um, you know, even my company is part of some of these programs in the UK and the US. Sachin, could you give us an example for us who are not part of the industry uh, about what is, what's cutting edge, you know, where's technology taking the industry, if you give us an example, that would be great. So, okay. Um, so let me talk a little bit broadly now, right? So in the last few weeks, or maybe in the last month or so, maybe, you probably noticed that the billionaires have started going to space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. said Richard Branson has now, you know, uh, broken the uh, the space tourism boundary, if you like. Still $1 million, but don't forget, you know, prior to that, a space shuttle launch would have cost you $3.2 billion, right? With just three people on board. So, um, that Elon Musk's um, uh, launch of uh, SpaceX, you know, he's bought 2,000 satellites already up in space and provided um, internet connectivity to underserved uh, regions. This is all aerospace technology, right? And Jeff Bezos just last week, you know, in his, uh, in his famous uh, rocket. So with this now, the aerospace industry is not just planes. It's all of these industries which are highly regulated that require um, that level of technology. I would say that that encompasses the aerospace industry because um, if you're in aircraft manufacture, you get involved with satellites, you get involved with other things as well. So I think 
when you look at this in context of Malaysia, then uh, Malaysia has been an aerospace manufacturing country for the last 30 plus years. Tun Mahathir started the whole thing back in the uh, so late 80s. Um, and now we are one of the, we are an integral part of the global supply chain. So if we stop, for example, Toulouse will stop producing aircraft, right? So with that kind of positioning, and we do design and build, we design our product. So if you look out the window of an A320, uh, which is an Air Asia aircraft, everything that moves on the back of the wing is designed and built in Malaysia. Not many people know that, but that's that's where we are. So I think um, where we are leading now is that um, urban air mobility, electrical propulsion, hydrogen propulsion, that's where uh, the next phase of, of transportation for the common man is going, right? And if you look at Airbus and Boeing and all these guys, they're already well invested into that. And then you see the automotive players, Geely and so on and so forth, also invested in things like air mobility, urban air mobility. So that's going to be the future of transportation. Um, and what's a what's a flying car, right? It's a car without a highway <laughs> or infrastructure. So a car without infrastructure is actually a very powerful idea if you think about it, right? If I can access now unaccessible areas before without needing to build infrastructure, I can pretty much open up the country to many different types of possibility, economic possibilities, right? Right. Naja, I mean, you know, when you're describing all of this to us, it feels like you have you're quite optimistic about the future of this of this sector um, and the recovery of the sector post in a in a pandemic world. And I'm just wondering um, for Malaysian companies to make sure that we're not left behind, that we are, uh, compet uh, you know, technologically competitive in the sector. What do, what is required? I'm just thinking about the kind of support that's required from, say, government government agencies, and also perhaps the buy-in from the companies and their management as well. So okay, let's start with the the, the last point that you make: the buy-in from the management, the companies. Like I said, you know, like uh, give the example of risk management, right? So. Like I said, on the onset of um, the pandemic, right? So prior to any government sort of uh, edict on uh, SOP and so on and so forth, the aerospace industry adjusted, right? Immediately we put in the SOPs and so on and so forth, right? And that's because of the way that these companies are structured, right? The CEOs, the management are all strategic thinkers, effectively. That's a fundamental problem in Malaysian industry today. You have a lot of off-taking, right? So, um, you know, if you read Mariana Mazzucato's book, a lot of rent seekers, right? So, effectively, what you're looking at is a complete change in mindset from basically off-takers to builders, right? And I think that's the biggest challenge we find in our industrial landscape. Uh, people don't really want to embrace the new norm. They want to go back to the old norm in a new way. And that's going to be an issue because uh, with the aerospace industry, if you want to get into it, right, um, you not only have to cope with the situation that we've had prior to this, but it is already moving into the next phase of what the industry is going to be and then expect its supply chain to be up to speed with that. Uh, so leadership is a major, major issue and maturity of industry is a major issue. So we've got some sort of anchor companies like UMW Aerospace, uh, Spirit Aerosystems, uh, General Electric, right, which are well, well, um, well established in Malaysia with uh, with a great uh, manpower and great, great skills. All Malaysian, I might add, um, but we do have an issue with the SME supply chain supporting that. So we find today that the maturity of the SME supply chain is a major stumbling block as far as growing the MRO and the manufacturing industry is concerned. And I think this will be reflected across all sort of industry 4.0 type of activities in the country today. Because you're, you're talking about a different kind of company, a different kind of character, a different kind of Malaysia. And this is where I think uh, people will have to start embracing this change. Otherwise, you can already see the writing on the wall, right? Um, a lot of these companies are not going to survive the, the, the post-COVID world. Right. Now, that was Najib Mohamed No from Strand Aerospace. We're going to take a quick break here on Consider This, but more in just a couple of minutes. So stay tuned. We'll be right back.